Hello all, welcome back to our discussion on atmospheric waves. Today we'll be discussing internal gravity waves. So internal gravity waves are on a much finer scale than the Rossby waves that we discussed in the previous lecture. In fact, these can be found generally on the mesoscale, generally in response to either flow over topography or thunderstorms or other mesoscale systems. The most prominent and vi visual effects uh, that arise due to internal gravity waves are cloud streaks, at, uh, cloud streaks and lenticular clouds. However, they are also associated with rapid local temperature and pressure changes, vor local vorticity, and clear air turbulence. Internal gravity waves are particularly important in atmospheric motions because they're responsible for carrying energy and momentum, typically from the ground up into the middle atmosphere, either into the stratosphere or the mesosphere. The advantage of internal gravity waves is they can propagate in essentially any direction in the atmosphere. So they provide a mechanism by which energy can be transported by natural oscillations within the atmosphere. Atmospheric gravity waves will only exist when the atmosphere is stably stratified. That is when the brunt visala frequency squared is greater than zero. This is because internal gravity waves have buoyancy as a restoring force. And if the atmosphere is unstable, then buoyancy does not act as a restoring force, but instead drives instability in the system. So in the presence of deep convection, one would not anticipate to have uh, a strong presence of internal gravity waves. <clears throat> In an incompressible fluid, typically gravity waves propagate along the surface, and these are surface gravity waves. These are con to be contrasted with internal gravity waves where the uh, oscillations are within the interior of the fluid. These typically arise in the atmospheric system because of stable stratification. That is, there is no discontinuity between fluids of uh, constant density, but instead we have a continuous change in density throughout the whole vertical extent of the atmosphere. Here's an example of topographic gravity waves. Here we're seeing a cloud street response to a isolated island. As flow is pushed upwards over the island, it leads to oscillations within the atmosphere, which then lead to regions of condensation and lack of condensation. Hence, we see a very pronounced effect in the cloud formation that arises from this, uh, from this oscillation. We also can see, for instance, an internal gravity wave via a undular bore, which is a very famous phenomenon known for large-scale, very foreboding-looking wave-like motion in cloud systems. Um, these clouds are usually large-scale and are associated with large internal gravity oscillations. We also have here another view of mountain generated waves, Lee waves, um, shown via atmospheric oscillations. Here you have basically continuous spacing between uh, individual clouds which correspond to the spacing between crests of the internal gravity wave. So this can then be used in order to measure the wavelength associated with the internal gravity oscillations. Okay, so our derivation of internal gravity waves is a bit complicated, but I'll try to go through it with as much explanation as possible. Since we're working on a finer scale than the planetary scale, we can assume that rotation can be neglected, and we're going to assume no friction in the system. This will lead to purely oscillatory motion. So these can be studied <clears throat> with the basic equations for 2D XZ plane motion with the Boussinesq approximation which we'll derive later on. The usage of this Boussinesq approximation, that is nearly, uh, nearly con constant density fluid, will lead to a continuity equation which appears in the third line here. That is purely that it is the divergence of the velocity field equal to zero. And hence we do not track density via the continuity equation. This set of equation represents four equations in five unknowns, that is u, w, p, rho, and theta, and hence we need some sort of uh, equation of state in order to close the system. The equation of state that we will be using in this case is the potential temperature equation, which as you recall looks like the equation shown here. We can rewrite the, the temperature term in here in terms of pressure and density <clears throat> via the ideal gas law, and that then leads to a form of the 
potential temperature relationship shown on the right-hand side. If we then take the logarithm of both sides, we can then isolate the multiple. Um, we can then isolate the individual product terms using the fact that the log of products is equal to the sum of logarithms, and hence obtain a formula for potential temperature shown below. All right, we're going to linearize the basic equations by setting up a mean state. We're going to assume roughly constant density in the background, that is rho naught is constant and not a function of height. However, we're going to assume that pressure and theta are both functions of height. And further, we're going to have a mean background flow, u bar, which is assumed to be uniform in space. Consequently, we obtain the linearization shown here. Note that the mean background state must satisfy the so-called zero-order equations. That is, the, uh, in the absence of perturbations, we must have that the mean state satisfies inherent balance of the system. Hence, they must satisfy hydrostatic balance, shown here as dp bar dz equals minus g rho naught, and it must also satisfy the, uh, <coughs> the closure of the systems, which is the potential temperature equation shown here on to the bottom right. So we're going to linearize the material derivative terms first of all. We're going to take the material derivative of the u velocity, substitute in u bar plus u prime, and expand out individual terms, noting that u bar is constant, and hence any derivative of u bar is equal to zero, and also dropping terms which are the product of perturbations. Here, those being u prime di u prime di x and w prime di u prime di z. Consequently, the material derivative simply reduces to di u prime di t plus u bar di u prime di x. Applying a similar uh, expansion for the material derivative of w, <coughs> we note that um, small terms can be dropped, that is, products of perturbations can be dropped, um, and so we arrive at di w prime di t plus u bar di w prime di x. We linearize the thermodynamic equation using an analogous procedure, except here noting that since theta bar is a function of the vertical coordinate z, that this term cannot be dropped in this relationship, since di theta bar di z is assumed to be a mean state quantity. Hence, following the uh, linearization, one that obtains that the material derivative of theta is given by di theta prime di t plus u bar di theta prime di x, that is horizontal transport of theta, bar, of theta prime, as well as w prime di theta bar di z, that is vertical transport of mean potential temperature theta. We now linearize hydrostatic balance term, or the buoyancy term, by substituting in, again, the expansion for density and pressure, noting that um, we can apply the binomial expansion in order to write the uh, 1 over rho naught plus rho prime term as 1 over rho naught times 1 minus rho prime over rho naught. Linearization which is obtained by then substituting this relationship into the top equation, then yields a form of the buoyancy term which looks like 1 over rho naught times di p prime di z plus rho prime over rho naught times g. Here we have also made use of the fact that the mean state satisfies hydrostatic balance. <clears throat> Linearizing the potential temperature equation, we then substitute theta uh, the expansion for theta p and rho into the potential temperature equation uh, use the fact that logar the product of uh, the logarithm of the product is equal to the sum of individual logarithms, and that in using a Taylor series expansion, that the logarithm of one plus epsilon for epsilon small is approximately equal to epsilon. Applying these rules to the potential temperature equation then leads to the linearized potential temperature equation shown below. That is, that density perturbations are approximately given by minus rho naught times uh, perturbations in potential temperature, normalized by the mean potential temperature, plus perturbations in the pressure field, normalized by the speed of sound squared. So in gravity waves, we note that density fluctuations due to pressure changes are generally small compared to those due to temperature exchange, uh, changes, and hence we will assume that the uh, 
that buoyancy due to potential temperature perturbations is going to be much larger than buoyancy due to pressure variations. So to a first approximation then, the potential temperature equation simply reduces to minus rho prime over rho naught is approximately equal to theta prime over theta bar. Note that in conjunction now with the buoyancy term, this allows us to eliminate rho from the equations of motion. So applying um, this linearization to the original equations that we had, we have that the material derivative is replaced by this linearized material derivative, and we also have that the buoyancy term has been replaced by a term which, is, uh, which contains perturbations of the potential temperature field. Hence, we have successfully eliminated rho prime from these equations, and hence made it a system of four equations for four unknowns. We will now try to reduce the system down to a single equation in a single unknown using a procedure analogous to Gaussian elimination. That is, we will take linear combinations of individual equations with different differential operators applied to the expansion in order to eliminate individual um, perturbation terms. So first we're going to eliminate P prime by using equations 2 and 1 and the operators shown here. This then leads to uh, an elimination of P prime in equation number five. We now eliminate U prime from equation number five by combining it with the continuity equation in order to replace U primes with W primes, hence leading to an evolution equation which purely contains W primes and theta primes. Now recall that the potential temperature equation also only contains theta primes and w primes, so we can eliminate theta prime then by combining with the, con with the thermodynamic equation using this combination of operators in order to yield a single equation for w prime. Note that the only uh, coefficient term that shows up here is the square of the brunt Faisalo frequency in the form g over mean potential temperature times the derivative of potential temperature with respect to z. We also have a number of operator terms here, including the square of the mean material derivative, as well as a Laplacian of W prime. So this equation basically represents the linearization and, uh, of internal gravity waves and explains how um, vertical velocity perturbations behave inside internal gravity waves. Um, in order to, the next step in looking for wave-like motion is to consider wave-like solutions where W prime is purely a function of um, a coefficient term, W hat, which is assumed constant, as well as a wave-like solution in terms of both uh, the zonal coordinate and the vertical coordinate. So this looks like e to the i kx plus mz minus nu t. Note that um, both W hat, which represents the magnitude of W, and M can both be complex numbers, that is, com consisting of both real and imaginary parts, and hence, in order to uh, only get the physical solution, that is, the real part, we need to expand out um, this product of complex numbers in order to obtain, um, in order to obtain only the real part of the solution. Note that the solution then reduces to W prime, which is equal to the real part of W hat WR times cosine of the real part of phi, minus WI times sine of the real part of phi, and then all of that multiplied by a decay term. Note that it here denoting decay in the vertical direction for MI positive, which is given by E to the minus MIZ. Since the horizontal wave number K is always real, the resulting solution will always be sinusoidal in the horizontal plane, um, but can either be sinusoidal or exponential in the vertical. So the wave number m is always complex. The real part of m then describes sinusoidal variations of z. This is the contribution to the real part of phi, and the imaginary part mi describes the exponential decay or growth of the wave with height depending on the sign of mi. Recall for mi positive, as you can see here, that w prime will decay with height, whereas for mi negative, the exponential will be positive, and hence you'll see growth of the wave with height. If m is purely real, 
then the wave number can be regarded as a vector directed perpendicular to the line of constant phase and in the direction of phase increase. Note that if m is complex or imaginary, then one cannot apply this analysis directly. So we're going to insert this into the evolution equation for w prime, and that will then lead to the internal gravity wave dispersion relation shown here. That is, we simply replace all the time derivatives with frequency nu, we replace x derivatives with k, and we replace the Laplacian with a k squared plus m squared, and note in particular that the sign of individual terms needs to be accounted for in this expansion. The internal gravity wave frequency then is obtained by solving the dispersion relation for frequency, and that's given by u bar k plus or minus uh, brunt weissala frequency times k divided by the square root of k squared plus m squared. So interestingly, we see here that um, the, there are two possible solutions for the frequency that arise from this relationship, and that's due to the fact that when we take the square root of the nu minus mu bar, or u bar k term, um, you get both positive and negative solutions. So relative to the mean wind then, the positive sign implies eastward phase propagation, which can be observed by dividing this equation through by k and observing that for um, front Faisala frequency positive and k positive, that a positive sign corresponds to waves which propagate faster than the mean flow, and for the negative sign we have waves which propagate westward relative to the mean flow. So let us now consider a particular choice of k and m. If we let k be greater than zero and m be less than zero, then for lines of constant phase, they will tilt eastward with increasing height. Um, the choice of the positive root here then leads to a phase velocity that is positive in the x direction and negative in the uh, z direction, that is using Using the fact that the phase velocity in the z direction is just simply equal to frequency divided by m, and using the fact that m is negative, this will correspond to eastward and downward phase propagation relative to the mean flow. So the zonal and vertical phase speeds then can be written out in, the, uh, in accordance with the formula below. There are a number of phase relationships that we can then derive um, using this basic setup. For instance, we can look back at the initial equations that we use, the linearized equations that we used in order to derive the, um, the relationship for the evolution equation for w prime. And using these equations, we can then substitute in wave-like solutions in order to find how the different variables are related to one another. So substituting in wave-like solutions for u will then give us a relationship for u that is u equals minus m over k times w prime. Note that if m is again negative and k is positive, then the result is that u will be maximal when w prime is maximal. Similarly, u will be minimal or at its largest negative value when w prime is also at its largest negative value. Repeating this process for pressure, one finds that pressure is related to u prime via the relationship shown here, um, and in particular that for the case where um, the numerator is positive, maximum pressure will occur at regions of maximum zonal velocity, and minimum pressure will occur at regions of minimum zonal velocity. For temperature, we have a slightly different result. Here we have that a I, uh, an imaginary I here shows up in the numerator of the theta prime perturbation. This result is derived from the uh, thermodynamic equation that we used previously. The presence of the I means that we actually have a term which is proportional to e to the i pi over 2, and consequently there is a phase shift by pi over 2 associated with the theta prime perturbation relative to the w prime perturbation. The overall result then is that theta prime is out of phase with perturbations in w prime. And in fact, the maximum for theta prime is one quarter of a wavelength ahead of the maximum in w prime. So in summary, u 
prime, w prime, and p prime are all exactly in phase with one another when nu minus ku bar is greater than zero. However, theta prime or t prime are out of phase in uh, internal gravity waves by one quarter of a wavelength. We'll see in a moment how that actually is exhibited within the flow. Further, we observe that this wave, that internal gravity waves are transverse. That is, the phase vector, which is perpendicular to constant phase lines given by the vector k, when dotted with the velocity field u, actually gives zero, suggesting that these two vectors are perpendicular to one another. So we now look at a cross section for internal gravity waves. If we let k again be greater than zero and m less than zero, then we obtain the image depicted here. Constant phase lines, here maxima or, min or minima, are depicted with black lines. The regions of maximum velocity are shown with arrows, which are parallel to constant phase lines and perpendicular to the phase vector k vec. The maximum temperature uh, occurs along phase lines, so along the black line shown here, with an oscillatory pattern from cold to warm as depicted. Pressure is aligned with maximums in the velocity field, which appear halfway between the black phase lines depicted on this diagram. That is, regions of high pressure correspond to maximum x velocity, and regions of low pressure correspond to maximum negative zonal velocity. Further, maximum zonal negative velocity corresponds to maximum W prime, hence leading to velocities which are aligned with phase lines um, and point at maximum extent to the uh, upward and to the east, and in, when in the opposite phase, downward and to the west. So take a, have a look at this figure briefly and try to take it in, as a lot of information is displayed here. But Interestingly enough, we are able to see from this image exactly how internal gravity waves are behaving in the atmosphere. We're going to see phase propagation down and to the right, while the velocity field actually oscillates transverse to these phase lines upward and to the right. So writing down phase velocities and group velocities using our formula for phase and group velocity, we obtain these formulas shown here. In particular, you may notice that the vertical component of the group velocity actually has a sign which is opposite to the vertical phase speed. That is, there is a switch in sign. Here in the bottom right of formula, you will see that it shows minus and plus rather than plus or minus. And it's a consequence of this that downward phase propagation um, associated with an internal gravity wave corresponds to upward energy propagation. So the natural response to topography then is for energy to be emitted away from the topography, which will then correspond to downward phase propagation. That is, we will see the phase lines associated with the IGW that respond to topography actually pointed downward. So horizontal phase and group velocities point in the same direction. That is, there's no sign change associated with these horizontal quantities, but in opposite directions for the vertical component. That is, internal gravity waves, energy actually travels parallel to crests and troughs. So the energy propagation is actually parallel to the velocity field, which is perpendicular to the phase lines. So one will then see that the energy away from a topographic element, for instance, will be uh, extending upwards away from that topographic element, even when phase is propagating downwards towards the ground. So showing that here in this image of, uh, again, depicting phase and group velocity of internal gravity waves, group velocity will occur along phase lines, perpendicular to the phase vector, uh, and so will be transported along these lines. One can compute the angle of phase lines to the local vertical, and it actually turns out via some simple algebra that you can show that the angle of these phase lines are k over kappa um, for eastward propagating modes and minus k over kappa for westward propagating modes. 
with taking this into account then, one can then compute the um, intrinsic frequency of these waves, that is the frequency ignoring the local mean wave speed, which is going to be equal to the frequency minus u bar k, and one finds that this quantity is actually equal to plus or minus of the brunt visala frequency times the angle of the phase lines to the local vertical. So this suggests that since k is always less than kappa, that the intrinsic frequency of the, uh, of the internal gravity wave oscillations, that is the frequency that we actually observe for oscillating internal gravity waves in the atmosphere, um, is actually less than the brunt visala frequency. Here are two links showing images um, which depict the evolution of internal gravity waves. The first one showing propagation of an internal gravity wave packet and how group velocity can, prop can be perpendicular to phase velocity. In the second link, we see observed internal gravity waves in the atmosphere showing propagation of phase lines perpendicular to um, the group, group speed or wave packet associated with these waves. All right, so we're going to look at topographic gravity waves. So these are a particular type of internal gravity wave which are driven by underlying bottom topography. So this implies a lower boundary condition on W, which then forces the underlying waves. The uh, zonal wave number K will then be determined by the, um, by the behavior of the underlying topography. So for stationary waves, we have nu is equal to zero. That suggests that the intrinsic frequency is minus u bar k, and hence is westward relative to the mean flow, in all cases for all stationary waves. The wavelength k is determined by the wavelength of the topography, and so the flow must follow the topography near the ground, leading to a forced wave number for internal gravity wave solutions. So for example, one might have a mountain height profile which looks like a cosine, in which case the wavelength of the cosine determines the zonal wave number of the internal gravity wave oscillations. So topographic gravity waves are stationary waves, that is there's no time variation associated with these waves, and hence in the steady state we can neglect the time derivative from the evolution equation for W prime. This leads to a simplified formula which simply looks like um, a Laplacian of W prime plus buoyancy frequency squared divided by mean velocity squared times W prime. Note here we have factored out the operator, uh, the second derivative operator in X in order to obtain this formula. Seeking stationary wave solutions, we again substitute in wave-like solutions for W prime and observe that we obtain an A dispersion relationship that looks like M squared equal to buoyancy frequency squared divided by U bar squared, all of which is uh, all of which minus the zonal wave number K squared. Recall again that W hat, that is the magnitude of the internal gravity wave oscillations, is a complex number, as well as the uh, vertical wave number m. Here mr corresponds to oscillatory solutions and mi corresponds to growth and decay of the underlying solutions. So here what's worth noting however is that the right hand side of uh, this equality is actually a real number. That is for stably stratified flow the buoyancy frequency is a real number, u bar is a real number, and k is a real number. Hence m which is simply the square root of this value, can only take on either a purely real value or a purely imaginary value. If the right-hand side is positive, m will be purely real. If the right-hand side is negative, then m will be purely imaginary. So hence the solutions for vertically propagating waves um, take on the form shown here. Um, for the case of m squared real, one actually has then that m is oscillatory in the vertical direction. Hence we obtain solutions which look like the figure here. That is for a wide mountain we have small k which then corresponds to real m. In this case the oscillations are tilted with height and so we have a phase intrinsic phase speed ve vector here shown in green which is to the left 
and downward. Um, we also have a intrinsic group velocity vector which corresponds to upward propagation of energy away from the topography and we have oscillatory solutions which do not decay with height. That is, they maintain a constant uh, amplitude regardless of the height away from topography. These are known as vertically propagating waves and are associated with wide mountains. For the other possible solution, if we have that the mean velocity is greater than the buoyancy frequency divided by k, this corresponds to um, large values of k or very short mountains, we then have that the right-hand side will be negative, and hence m will be a purely imaginary quantity. The wave solution then takes on the form w prime equal to its magnitude times e to the ikx, that is it still has zonal propagation in the x direction, but it decays with height in accordance with, um, with e folding rate mi. That is, over, that is mi determines a vertical length scale or rate at which the decay occurs. Note that for larger values of mi, the waves will decay faster with height. Solutions in this case are perfectly aligned with topography, so there is no inherent tilt associated with the system, and hence no momentum transport associated with the waves. So for a narrow mountain, we have large k leading to m imaginary. Ridges and trough lines are perfectly aligned with the topography, no tilt of the system, and a decay in the overall amplitude of the wave with height. These are known as vertically trapped waves and occur over rapidly varying topography. So in summary, vertical propagation of gravity waves is only possible when the mean background flow times k is less than the buoyancy frequency, or the brunt visala frequency. For stable stratification, wide ridges, and relatively weak zonal flow, we get favorable conditions for vertically propagating gravity waves, that is, gravity waves which are tilted with respect to the location of the mountain. If energy is transported upwards, we must also have that phase is aligned downwards. So for more realistic internal gravity waves, the ones that we considered here are fairly idealized and do not capture a lot of the more complicated features associated with these gravity waves. But more, complicated, more realistic internal gravity waves are associated with turbulence, rotating flow, and breaking waves, all of which are not properly captured by the linear theory. Nonetheless, the linear theory does provide very good guidance on how exactly energy is transported relative to the flow, and hence will provide a very good mechanism by which we can assess turbulence and other features above topography. Here I'm depicting a lenticular cloud, which is a feature of um, leeward gravity waves, uh, leeward internal gravity waves, due to large-scale oscillations in the lee of a mountain. These are very unique featured waves and will generally only appear eastward of large mountain ranges. However, if you have a chance, check out the movie shown below, as it'll give a good depiction on how exactly lenticular clouds are formed and how they evolve.